Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. My name is Yusuf Ismail. I'm an attorney, a debater, and a public speaker. At least two years ago, I was a regular on ITV doing a program called I Beg to Differ, which focused on interactive debate on socio-political, cultural, and indeed religious issues contemporaneous to South African society. Well, as we've mentioned uh, over the previous past few days this week, we do have something special in store. We will be focusing on confronting Islamophobia and some of the crucial misconceptions that exist in this world. We will be tackling a lot of these issues. We have a fantastic, fantastic lineup for all of you out there. And today I have, tonight actually, I have someone special uh, joining us all the way from Saudi Arabia, but originally hailing from the United States of America, uh, the one and only uh, Dr. Samuel Shropshire. Now, Sam Shropshire is someone that is um, quite dear to me. I had a, 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 a significant experience. The first time I think I met him was, I, I believe, in 2016 when I was involved in a discussion or a debate with an Egyptian extremist by the name of Usama Dagduk. And um, Sam and I met for the first time and we interacted and he's someone that touches your heart when he speaks and he communicates his message. Um, Sam has been and had more than 30 years of experience as a founder, a CEO and a director of business, education, non-governmental organizations. He's a passionate and effective speaker. He's made countless motivational and educational presentations and speeches before government entities. Uh, he has worked uh, successfully lobbying U.S. Congress, the Canadian uh, and British parliaments, the United Nations. He has been on the foreign and state policy teams that introduced bills to the U.S. congressional and state legislative committees. He's an avid writer and a motivator, and Shropshire has been an active leader for many years in the past in the Annapolis area in Maryland, in the state of Maryland. He was, in fact, even elected to the Annapolis City Council in 2005, garnering overwhelming support from both Democrats and Republicans. And he's currently uh, in the field of religious reconciliation, uh, lecturing on environmental concerns. He's with the Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation, quite a remarkable group. And it's my privilege and pleasure to invite him to the platforms of South Africa on the various media platforms that we are operating on this week. Welcome to South Africa once again, as I'd like to call you, Uncle Sam. How do you do? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Walaikum salam. I'm very happy to be back in South Africa, but I hope to be there in person as soon as possible. Inshallah, we'd like to make that happen soon. There's been just so much happening. Um, presently, Uncle Sam, as I, uh, as, as you have indicated, you are based in Saudi Arabia, but you were originally from the United States, and you're now presently running the Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. Uh, can, can you probably just give us a bit of the, the, the uh, why I think it's important, the background in terms of where you hail from and what you were in fact dealing with? Because at some point in time, I do understand you were the State Department uh, way back in the 80s uh, during the Bush administration. Yes, um, not with the State Department, but lobbying the State Department. I would say I worked in the field of human rights and religious freedom for some 25 years, primarily in Washington and at the United Nations. But I'm, um, I came to Saudi Arabia in 2011 to work on a project involving Quran. I'm an ordained Christian pastor. I didn't know anything about uh, Quran when I arrived here, but I can tell you, I began learning. I was here to correct the English text in a new translation of the Quran. Uh, it was being done by Safi Kaskas, who's gonna be with you later on this program. But uh, Safi invited me here. They gave me a plane ticket to come. I, when I got off the plane, I knew nothing. I was scared to death from everything I'd seen on American TV. I, <laughs> I didn't know so, anything about Islam. You know, I saw everything, uh, terrorism. And when I walked down the streets here, I was scared to death. <clears throat> but gradually over time, I began to realize that what I'd been taught by American news media was all a lie, was a hoax. 
and that people in Saudi Arabia were just like you and me, just like in America. Uh, they were kind, they were good. It was the love of the people living in Saudi Arabia that eventually helped me to understand Islam and brought me to the conclusion that I'd been a Muslim all my life. What 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 triggered the transfer? As I understand, you came then in 2011. Prior to that, and certainly, I mean, you know, with, within within the trajectory of of a contemporary uh, religious political history, and I don't want to kind of bog the entire discussion, but within that whole trajectory, it seems that 9/11 for many Americans and indeed for the world was a turning point in terms of how, I mean, Islam came into the into the kind of public arena. I mean, prior to that, the 80s and the 70s, popular culture in the United States was by and large dominated by the communist threat. I mean, and this was evident, for example, even in the in the Rambo movies, um, you have, I, I recall uh, viewing one of the Rambo movies where uh, Sylvester Stallone fights against the Soviets, but he actually is on the side of the Mujahideen, uh, who were actually backed by the Reagan administration you, 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 in what capacity? I just want to before we can go to your transition. In what capacity were you, in fact, lobbying various um, uh, um, aspects within the state apparatus uh, in terms of what the trajectory you wanted to achieve? Well, I looked for U.S. congressmen and members of the British and Canadian parliaments who would travel with me. Let's look at Romania, for instance, in the mid '80s. Yeah. Uh, the Ceausescu family ruled over Romania. It was a dictatorship. Uh, Nicolae Ceausescu was, he called himself communist, but it was in all practical purposes, just a dictator. We look for places where Christians, Muslims, and Jews were having problems with their faith. There were 185 Muslims, Christians, and Jews in prison in Romania because of their faith. Uh, we, I took uh, members of the U.S. Congress, you know, I wanted to meet with Ceausescu. Ceausescu family wouldn't have anything to do with me. I put an open letter in, in the New York Times back in 1985. It already cost uh, $20,000 to buy that full page ad. We listed the names of all the prisoners. It was an open letter to Nikolai Ceausescu to tell him, let our people go, let these people of faith out. So um, I had already created quite a stir in Romania before I went there the first time. I took uh, one congressman with me the first time, Mark Silgender, and then I later took an, uh, three others, Frank Wolf, Chris Smith, and, um, and one other, whose name slips me right now, but we were very powerful. As we walked around Romania, it was Tony Hall. Uh, as we walked around the streets of Romania, uh, we were followed by radio and television inside the country. And you know, Nikolai Ceausescu and his family would never meet with me. But if I have three congressmen and two members of the British parliament sitting there with me, who sure. And, and I just want to ask you questions. Go ahead. I just um, want to unpack at that at that stage, Uncle Sam. Were you were you were you you what what was your denomination? Because it's quite rare in the eighties for someone to be concerned. Well, at least in that context, the rights of all religious people. Okay. What denomination were you part of? Um, at that I was what, Presbyterian, what was Presbyterian, okay. Reformed Church. And uh, I was the president in uh, Christian Solidarity International, which is based in Zurich, Switzerland. I was the U.S. president. And in this capacity, I was able to approach congressmen. Now we work in the name of Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. I am a Muslim. I have been a Muslim since I was three years old. I just didn't realize it until I got here. Now we're going to be approaching the U.S. Congress we hope to build an office in a, on Capitol Hill near the U.S. Congress. We're working on this right now. We're in the fundraising period, and we'll be living next to the U.S. Congress and lobbying uh, 
Congress, as well as the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So let's move then to 2011. You came to Saudi Arabia and you were called um, to, to look at a translation, as I understand, by Safi Kaskas. By the way, I haven't, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting a copy of that translation by Dr. Safi Kaskas. I'm, I believe it's quite an impressive uh, translation and it's very contemporaneous. Um, but you were called to essentially look at the English text. What, 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 what was it? What, why, did, why did they specifically get you there to that for that very purpose? Well, it was interesting. They wanted me to proofread. See, I had um, I was a graduate of a Christian college. I studied theology in uh, undergraduate school. I studied at three different uh, seminaries, postgraduate. And they wanted someone with Christian background to come and look at this and to proofread and to ask questions. Well, I'd never read the Quran before until I got here, but I can say within the first six months, I read it maybe 10 times. And uh, so in the process, my life began to change. I was reading about Asa or Jesus, who was the uh, Messiah and the Christ, as the Christians believe. I was reading uh, that Jesus had done many miracles, including raising the dead back to life again. I was reading that he was virgin born of the Virgin Mary. Mary was exalted above all other women. Uh, I was just astounded at what I was reading in the Quran. And uh, what, 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 what was your what was your preconception then? Surely, as a, as a minister, because most ministers do, as I understand at divinity school, have some degree of cursory study about Islam. Um, were you were you at any stage prior to that period? taught about the Quran within the ministries that you were studying within divinity school or theological school about Islam, about the Quran, about the Prophet Muhammad, uh, because it appears to me at Moody Bible studies and even at um, Fuller, Fuller Theological Seminary, most of these causes and, 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 and seminaries have specific studies about Islam, but more often than not biased, biased towards the Quran, biased towards Islam, and very critical in certain instances. So, my question to you is, prior to that, what you know, obviously you had read it for the first time, but what was your uh, kind of precursor? What was the, the impression that was given to you by those teaching you in reaching the ministry that you had eventually reached? Well, I had Muslim friends in Romania that I had met. Many of them were in prison. I met, uh, I had Muslim friends in the United States uh, the daughter of Malcolm X is a friend of mine. I had her come and speak at Annapolis High School when I was on the city council. So in that sense, I was somewhat familiar, but I wasn't familiar with the Quran. I'm, um, I've never been a rabid anti-Muslim, but let me say, you know, when 9-11 happened, that just raised the ire of all Americans. Uh, Where were you on 9-11? Where were you on 9-11? <laughs> I was in my home watching on TV. I saw the accident, the first plane. I saw the second plane hit, and then everybody knew. <laughs> it, it was no accident. It was real. And uh, then gradually the facts came to light. Uh, 15 Saudis were involved on three different planes. One of them hit the Pentagon. There was a fourth plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. But uh, you have to look at radicalism and you have to look yeah. at terrorism. You know, sure. uh, not all Muslims, the Muslims I knew in America were not like that. None of them would have been involved in anything like this. In every faith today, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, in uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, they're radical terrorists. Mm -hmm. they, they like to make the evening news, so they blow themselves up or they, uh, they plant bombs in different places. All of this gets CNN attention, Fox News attention. Uh, but these people are not true to their faith. Uh, these people are crazy. 
And if you look at Muslim terrorists in the world today, who are they killing? They're killing more Muslims than they are Christians or Jews. Or it's an amazing situation. Right, so These horrendous. people are insane. It's, it's a horrendous thing. So, so coming back to the transition period, and then I'm going to unpack the aspects of Islamophobia and so on. So when you read the Quran, you, you read it about approximately, I mean, so many times, 10 times. What was the trigger there? If, if there was some, it, was, it, was it an evolved process where uh, as a leading Christian minister, you made this transition? Was it an evolutionary process or was there a trigger which made you come to dawn and realization that, look, I have always been a submitter. I've always surrendered my will to the will of God at inception. This is what I was from inception. What was that trigger that, that led to that? Well, it was my mother's teaching when I was three years old. My father died when I was only three months old. He was in a plane crash. He was a pilot. And then my mother moved my two much older brothers and sister and I back to North Georgia, small town Jefferson, and she would take us every Sunday to First Baptist Church. I being only three years old at the time, three and four, she would take me to, if I behaved in the church, she would say, okay, Sammy, you can go to the library and choose a book and I'll read it to you. And the book that I got many times because I like pictures of the Holy Land, had pictures of camels and sheep and men in long white Robes, uh, she would read this book. It was called The God of Abraham. And she would tell me, she would stop in the middle of the story, Sammy, Sammy, you got to listen. Look into my eyes. Uh, when you're older, you must always pray to the God of Abraham. There's only one God. I was taught that by a Christian mother. <laughs> she had never heard of Islam. I'm certain she never heard of Prophet Muhammad or Quran. She didn't know anything about it. And I began as I went, I went to a Christian boarding school for high school, then to Shelton College, Christian undergraduate, got a group degree in theology there, and then on to Faith Theological Seminary, Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, Seminary in California Graduate School of Theology. Whenever the issue of the Trinity came up, the words of the mother echoed in my ear. Sammy, there's only one God, the God of Abraham. You need to pray to the God of Abraham. So I realized as I studied Islam and I read uh, that Islam was opposed to Trinity, I'd been opposed to Trinity all my life. I didn't know anything about it. I would ask my college professor, why is why how can I understand Trinity? And the college professor would say, Well, you know, it's it's like an egg. There's a shell, there's egg white, there's egg yellow, one egg. <laughs> I would laugh. You mean God is like an egg? Oh no, 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 don't misunderstand me. When I got to college, Bob Carver told me, he said, you know, God is like a banana. You peel it. You squeeze the inside, there are three parts. Oh, God's like a banana. No, 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 he's not like a banana. I'm just trying to, finally I got to seminary and I asked my professor in seminary, I said, can you explain the Trinity to me in very simple terms? He said, it's a mystery, it can't be explained. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, Yeah, for the first time somebody told me the straight truth, that's besides my mother. So I was invited not just to proofread the English text and to look for possible uh, ways of explaining a matter better, but I was also invited to to cross-reference the Quran with the Bible. This had never been done before. So I added more than a thousand footnotes at the bottom of each page uh, uh, throughout the Quran, a thousand footnotes and Wherever the words grace and mercy were mentioned, I would show where it's mentioned in the Old Testament or New Testament. I would show um, where specific individuals were, were mentioned, Ibrahim, Abraham, Noah, Moses. I would show where they're mentioned in the Old Testament. I would give Old Testament references. It was an incredible opportunity. By the time I finished this, 
three-year project. It was like getting a, a PhD in Islamic studies. Don't have and, a, and that's I don't have a diploma, but I've got that Quran, and you're you. <laughs> I hope you get a copy soon. It can be ordered. Off I hope of, to get it. And that 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 that's a translation by Safi Kaskas. That's the one that you yes, it is. Uh, you, you spoke of highly. Long. Yeah, I'd I'd like to have a look at that uh, particular translation. I don't think it's too widely available in South Africa, but um, I'd, I'd certainly like uh, to get a copy and probably make it available to. It can be uh, ordered uh, off the internet, and no. uh, and just search Kaskas Quran. You'll find places where it's sold. So, so coming back to the idea then, and, and what I find amazing, because we, we discussed and touched about this yesterday, is that you found the difficulty in reconciling uh, the idea of the Trinity. And so you, you essentially had, when you came across the Quran, a confirmation of what you already were, uh, more, more than anything else, as opposed to simply uh, uh, taking a corrective approach, but it confirmed what you had always been and just simply put you back to say, look, here's the opening uh, in terms of identifying what your position of submitting to the will of the one and only God is. Yeah, let me say that probably 80 million Americans were taught this when they were in Sunday school, vacation Bible school. When they were very young, they were taught about the God of Abraham. But they don't know what is Islam. And it's up to us to explain that to them. Uh, one verbally, but also through our behavior, through, uh, through reflecting the behavior of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, studying his life totally changed me. I, it was an amazing situation. To, you know, Prophet Muhammad, he was a civil right, he was a human rights activist, according to the Medina Declaration. He was a civil rights activist, according to his last sermon. You know, a, a white's not better than a black. Uh, he said all races are equal. Uh, he was an animal rights activist. We know the story of the crying camel. He found a camel. Literally, I've seen camels here in Saudi Arabia. They cry. Tears run down their eyes. And I found he found a crying camel in a marketplace. It was overburdened with too heavy a load and it was malnourished. It hadn't been fed properly. It hadn't been watered properly. He said, who's the owner of this camel? And the owner finally came up and said, please forgive me, prophet. I won't do it again. And we know the story of the woman, a prostitute who dipped her shoe in the water and gave a drink to a dog. He said, she's, she's, she's going to be in Jannah. She's going to be in heaven. This is Prophet Muhammad. He was not only not only a, an animal rights activist, he was a women's rights activist. Women had equal opportunity for uh, in every field of life. Uh, he was anti-war, not pro-war. He was against war. He didn't want people to fight. But he said, if someone attacks you, you have a right to defend yourself. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, before the pandemic started, I took a group of Muslim youth, uh, young adults, to, to Japan. We went to the city of Hiroshima, where the first atomic bomb was dropped by America. That bomb killed immediately 70,000 people, and another 70,000 died over the next six months. Uh, that bomb killed, all, wiped out all plants, all animals within the city of Hiroshima were killed. Uh, it destroyed religious buildings. All of that is against the law, according to Islam. And innocent people died, children, babies. <laughs> we knelt and prayed at ground zero that God would help us as Muslims to end Weapons of mass destruction. The news media was coming to us afterwards. They were there uh, making videos and interviewing us. And they said, and they were laughing. <laughs> they said, Muslims against war? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Every day we see it on television. They said, yes. What happened here in this city is illegal. 
can't destroy crops and animals. You can't just kill innocent people. You can't destroy religious buildings. And you can't fight a war like this. This is in, inhuman. Um, they learned a lot. Do you realize that today, Islam is the fastest growing faith in Japan? Wow. Amazing. So it's certainly amazing. And, 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 and this takes me to this whole notion then that uh, we, we are now constantly faced with this neologism of um, which I've mentioned, um, you know, in, in introducing these programs of Islamophobia, the kind of inherent fear of Islam, um, the various dictionary definitions give the idea of a particularly intense dislike or fear of Islam as a political force. Uh, some sort of hostility or prejudice towards Muslims. Now, you've seen both sides of the world. I mean, you come from, you represent both, if I can call it in loose terms, the West and the East. You've seen both. C can you can you can you explain the psychology behind this? Because when you talk about radicalism and radical movements, it's a fairly recent phenomenon within the uh, the, the Muslim world vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Western world in the late latter part of the 20th century. But can you explain this intense aversion towards anything Islamic within the mainstream media and, of course, um, within popular literature, which has attained more and more currency today as the days go by, even in the context of the pandemic, we we still we enmeshed in the pandemic. But I mean, you know, there was a time at the beginning of this pandemic where in India, uh, the, the Indian government were, were blaming the Muslims for the spread of COVID uh, and then many other aspects uh, around this particular issue. I want you to explain to us probably what you believe is a psychology that is driving this degree and level of hatred and antagonism that we see around us. I think it's a fear of the unknown. The fear, we're all afraid of something we don't understand. And we need to... For every terrorist act committed, we Muslims need to be out there doing a thousand good works to overcome that one terrorist act. We, we need to be behaving like the Prophet Muhammad, uh, doing good things. Uh, this is our objective through Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation, to mirror the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad, to let the world know who he was, because he was very much like Jesus Christ. Uh, he had, um, he, he said, you can't do for yourself what you don't want done to your neighbor, or you don't want done to yourself what's you don't want done for your neighbor. He said, you've got to treat others with great respect. You have to, uh, you have to. Yeah. Image Islam teaches people to behave as Jesus would behave, yeah, uh, as all the prophets would behave. And as we look at their lives and begin to understand, there isn't a huge difference uh, in what's being taught uh, today in various faiths. We hope that um, we hope that we can communicate this throughout the world wherever we go. Our goal right now is to open a, an Islamic center. There are several Islamic centers. There are maybe over 25 around the Washington, D.C. area in, North, in Virginia, in Northern, uh, in Northern Virginia, and in Maryland. Uh, there are several mos mosques in Washington, D.C., but there is no Islamic center on Capitol Hill next to the U.S. Congress. And that's our goal over the next year to get this, um, get the ball going, to raise the funds to build an Islamic center. And we will have a, a meeting hall inviting people in from Congress. We'll have sleeping uh, apartments that we can rent out to congressional aides. This will be a place of education. It'll be a place of, of meeting. People can come and have meals. We'll have exhibits there about Islam. And we'll have speakers like you showing up to talk about Islam. Uh, we're excited about the future. We've just come back from traveling four months. We visited 28 U.S. states, driving 
from state to state to state, speaking three or four times a day, we realized that many Americans didn't understand what we were doing. They didn't know anything about Muslim Voice for Peace. We met with just about every major Christian leader in the United States, every uh, Muslim leader. We met with every Muslim organization. Uh, we met, uh, we held appointments, three or four appointments a day for four months. When we finished that, I, <laughs> I was quite heavy when we left for this trip. I lost 30 kilos during this four month trip. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I have a greater understanding of Islam in the United States, and I have great enthusiasm to keep going and to make this vision come true. That's a Muslim voice for peace and reconciliation. That's the the organization that you're based yeah. on. And, and I, I do believe, you, do you, do you, there, there are other like-minded organizations in the States. What are some of the challenges, for example, um, one, one, one prominent organization was CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, um, I believe at some point in time run by Ibrahim Hooper. Um, w- 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 there, there are, however, I mean, unlike your group, which is fairly new, a lot of these organizations that are combating Islamophobia within the United States are being viewed in a negative light. For example, I believe the Anti-Defamation League uh, and many other organizations have targeted these particular groups as being linked to Hamas or uh, being somewhat affiliated to extremist factions and so on. I mean, the, the, the general kind of slanderous um, ad- attacks that you get from Fox News and so on, how, how, how would you combat that? How would you combat that constant refrain of uh, labeling, even though you want to go and break down the chasm of misunderstanding that's existing? By telling the truth. By speaking truth to power. You know, I worked in Washington for 25 years. I targeted the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, We worked with the State Department. We worked with uh, United Nations in New York. We worked at the White House uh, with the Bush, uh, when Reagan and Bush administrations. We, people listened to what we had to say. Now I want to do it in the name of Islam. I have four young people who will be moving to Washington with me, Aysal Haj Hussein, Kuteba Al-Naki, and uh, Asa's brother Taj Hussein is going with us. And I'm going to be training them along with a number of American Muslim young, uh, young adults on how to lobby Congress, State Department, and United Nations. Well, why is it that it's 2021, 2022, going to 2022 now that um, almost now, probably 60 years later, and, um, you know, p- people like you, people like you should be should be supported um, to the hilt with what you're doing in terms of lobbying. And yet we find that in this time and age, the Jewish lobby, the Zionist lobby is still so powerful uh, in terms of dictating policy to the extent that at every single um, election electioneering campaign, if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, it is a compulsory, you know, it's like a compunction out there for the presidential elect to go and attend and speak to the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee. We, we yeah. as Muslims, I believe, I, I have now exceeded the Jewish population in the United States and yet still do not see the, um, the, the the struggle of organizations and groups like yours, which should be supported and other like-minded groups in presenting an effective bulwark to the Zionist influence in the United States, which is behind a lot of the Islamophobia that you see. A lot of the Zionist yeah. organizations, the Daniel Horowitz Foundation and so on, they, they pump out the negativity towards Islam and and, 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 and and your groups and, and others like you would, would provide an effective counterbalance to that. We don't see the support for that. Well, uh, that's one reason why we visited the United States and went to these 28 states was to contact Muslim leaders, let them know who we are, and to build a significant donor base within the United States. Uh, we have to have this. We can't survive without it. We're working on this, it's gonna come true, and uh, we're excited. But 
You're absolutely right about the Israeli lobby. Um, it's very strong. Many congressmen can feel they can't get elected without the support of APAC, American Israeli uh, lobby. But yeah. uh, this is is, is there a fear? Is, is there a fear, up, Uncle no? Sam? What's a, what's the fear? What is the fear? Because if they they've got the money, they've got the capital, but they're in a minority. So what is the fear that if they don't support the state of Israel, do not address APAC, don't uh, you know? Be the major the problem is in APAC. Now we have a Jewish Voice for Peace standing yeah. up. They've got. Uh, close to, they have hundreds of thousands of supporters throughout the United States. We work Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. We're closely aligned with Jewish Voice for Peace on different pieces of legislation affecting Palestine and the state of Israel. Um, many Jews in the United States are supporting the Palestinians. They see the injustices that U.S. U.S. has been supporting, but the major problem is an APEC. The major problem is evangelical conservative Christians mm. who are supporting the state of Israel and telling people that it's these are God's chosen people. Well, <laughs> uh, God has chosen you and he's chosen me as well. We're God's chosen people, people of faith, and we need to stand up and speak out. You know, God brought a number of people to Saudi Arabia to train them and to help them overcome uh, difficulties in their lives. Abraham came here. He was having marital problems. God told him to take Hajar and go to uh, go to Mecca. And that God would bless Abraham and Ishmael, his son, and they would uh, he would multiply the seed of Abraham greater than the of course. Stars in the sky and the sands on the beach. Uh, yeah. And this is happening. Now, we see also that uh, God brought Musa. Musa, acts, he killed someone in Israel and in, in Egypt. He was running from Pharaoh. And God told Musa to go to Midian, which is Arabia, in Arabia. Uh, God blessed Musa here for 10 years. Then Musa was told by Allah, by God, go back and speak truth to power in Egypt. And he did. And God blessed Musa and the, his descendants. Now, I've been, I'm certainly not like Musa, I'm not like Ibrahim. I'm just a sinner who God cleaned up through Arachman, Erohim, God, the most merciful. When I learned those two words, my life changed drastically. I found out I could go to Allah. I could go to God directly and confess my sins. And I found out that he was merciful. He would forgive me my sins. Oh, that, that was one of the greatest days of my life. No, I've been here 10 years. Like <laughs> Musa was here for 10 years. I've been here 10 years. Now I feel very strongly that Allah is telling me to go back to America and speak truth to power. And I'm taking a small contingent, small army with me, four or five brothers from here, and we'll pick up others from the United States. We'll move to Washington, D.C., be a part of our Center for Reconciliation, and we'll be working on Capitol Hill, emanating the proper behavior of Muslim, of the Prophet Muhammad, proving to the world that he was a human rights activist, civil rights activist, women's rights activist, a animal rights activist, and that he was anti-war. Hmm. We will be a major leader in the fight against nuclear weapons. Alhamdulillah. One of, one of the uh, questions people may want to know is um, the MVPR, what methodology uh, is employed? What, 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 what are some of the projects? I do understand about going from place to place in speaking and engaging in different individuals, but what are some of the other projects that you have in plan um, to, to achieve these particular <clears throat> objectives? 
Well, we have, we're, you know, the word Dawa, who is um, frowned upon in many societies today, but it simply means calling people to faith. We're calling people to faith. We have two means of calling. One, we call non-believers to the to understand who is God, who is Allah, and why Allah cares about them. Uh, we read in the Quran and the Old Testament of the, the Bible, God says, call unto me and I will answer you. We want people to call to God, non-believers. But as I've traveled all over the world, I find out that Muslims today, uh, you know, I think 1.7 million Muslims in the world today. Wow, that's a lot of Muslims. But how many of them truly are people of faith? How many of them attend the five daily prayers? How many of them truly believe? It's like Christians, you know, only, uh, you know, they say 60% of Christian youth today want nothing to do with organized religion. It's the same with Jews. And more and more, it's the same with Muslim youth. It's true. I find them everywhere. Uh, and I was recently speaking in Norway before the pandemic. And I was speaking at the Oslo Islamic Center. And I became, I needed a break. I told the imam, I said, I need to go out and get some fresh air. So I walked about a block down the street. And I see a young man leaning. He, he was leaning against the wall. I got closer. He's got needle tracks going up and down his arm. I said, looks like you're having a pretty bad time. And he started crying. He said, yes, I, I, need, I need help. I reached out and shook his hand. I said, what's your name? My name is Mohammed. You see, Muslim youth living in the West, they watch TV too. Whether it's in Germany, Norway, Japan, where they've grown up, they watch TV. And on TV, they see Muslim killing Muslim. Shaitan is whispering in their ears. He's laughing. Shaitan. And they're beginning to believe this is Islam. Mm. We need to reach them as well throughout the United sure. States and here in Saudi Arabia. Ace and I work at Bremen Prison. I go there, there are hundreds of Saudi youth in prison for drugs and alcohol. Mm. It isn't enough to call non-believers to faith when many people from our own faith are jumping, are jumping off the straight path. Absolutely. We have to effectively call them back and we have to give them drug rehabilitation programs. We have to help them just get help. I have young people throughout the United States coming to me saying, you know, uh, where can I go to get help for drugs and alcohol? And then I asked the mom, are there any AA programs or NA programs and Narcotics Anonymous programs here in the mosque? They said, no. And the children, the young people are telling me I can go down the street to a church and get help. That's mm. no. If Prophet Muhammad were here today, God, peace and blessings be upon him. We would see his behavior in this issue. And he would be compassionately calling young people back to the straight path. We need to do this. This is also an important part of Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation.
True. I want to, I want to, you know, that that's extremely moving to me, just listening you to you speak, um, um, uh, Uncle Sam. I just want to bring some, I believe we have a, we do have a, a, an impo- a noted guest on our uh, platform. I believe it is um, Muhammad Kuvadia, attorney Muhammad Kuvadia, that is on this platform and would probably like to join us and also interact with you, uh, Uncle Sam. Um, he's also involved in the field of Dawa, um, in, based in Johannesburg. Um, and uh, we're wondering if he's there. Muhammad, Brother Muhammad, are you there? Uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hear me, yourself? Yeah, wa alaikum salam, Muhammad. Uh, it's good to have you on our pl- program. Welcome. Thank you for having me this evening, and it's quite an uh, honor to be with Sam this evening on your show. Alhamdulillah. Uh, any questions? You are more than free to engage uh, our guest speaker, Brother Muhammad. No, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh uh, Sam. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam. It's nice to hear your passionate plea to us, and you know it makes us. It reminds us how fortunate some of us actually are, having been brought up in the environment of Islam. And when we see the effort that a lot of other people have made just to be in this beautiful religion. We, you know, there's a beautiful hadith by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه That none of you believe, will truly believe until he wishes for his brother that which he wishes for himself. And you have now seen and appreciated the value of Islam that it is in your, in your life and what it has brought. And it's very emotional to see you, you know, relate your story and like this, you know, we have, a, we have an obligation and a responsibility as Muslims. And the topic at hand today is Islamophobia. And I think, you know, the most important thing sometimes that we need to remember is that a phobia in itself um, is an overwhelming and unreasonable fear. And to allay this fear, uh, we need, we have an effort and we have, a work, we have work and we have a struggle. And that struggle is education and dawah. You know, we need to teach people you know, if it, the fear of the unknown is something that's innate to every human being. And as long as we can um, go out and reach out to people and explain to them the beauty of Islam and the simplicity of Islam, you'll find that the awareness of Islam continues to grow. Now, you know, you've come, you, you're living in an Islamic environment, but you know that in a Christian environment, the knowledge of Islam is lacking. And you know for a fact that uh, we have not done our job. As much as we have today social media and we have all these various platforms, I feel that more needs to get done to get the message of Islam across. And, you know, to allay the fears of Islamophobia, because in itself, there is an irrational fear, you know, and it it creates anxiety in a community whenever Islam or something relating to Muslim is actually taking place. So unnecessarily you're finding that there is an anxiety that should not have been there in the first place. So, you know, Jazakallah for the passionate uh, the introduction that you've given us about your background. Um, you know, I've heard about you and it's, it's a great opportunity for you to, to see you. And I'm grateful that, you know, you, you're continuing to do the work of Dawa and you want to extend the message out to people in a way that people can begin to appreciate and realize that there's nothing foreign about this stuff. It's one of the Abrahamic faiths, but at the same time, it's the most complete faith you'll ever find on the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, from my side, I, I, I really appreciate, you know, your input and your advices to us, and I'll take it to heart. And I just, you know, implore would use this opportunity to, to, to people to use uh, our platforms today to further the cause of Islam. Islam will continue to grow with or without our assistance. That is inevitable, you know. Mm-hmm. The reality of the situation is we just need to make an effort out there so that we can find that, you know, like, like yourself, there, there are millions of people that are searching for the truth. There are millions of people that need assistance. And if we are, as Muslims cannot provide that particular platform for them, then I feel at the same time we are lacking and we have not fulfilled our mandate as Muslims in our community. Yes, sir? Jazakallah. Now, thank you for that, Muhammad. I think that is quite crucial. Uh, Uncle Sam, any response uh, or comments you'd like to make in relation to that? That was Brother Attorney Muhammad Kuvadia. Um, I just agree with you wholeheartedly, Brother. Uh, it's more important how we behave than what we say. Yeah. It's our behavior that's going to bring people to Islam. 
It's our involvement in marching and protesting against nuclear weapons, in supporting the environment. You know, I have a brother in Australia, an imam, an Egyptian imam living in Australia. And when the great fires were breaking out across southern Australia, he went and he started rescuing koala bears. Mm. Many environmentalists have come to Islam through the behavior of that imam. Uh, it's our work on behalf of civil rights and human rights. When they see the Muslims lined up for these causes, it's going to bring people to Islam. It's our work in giving food to the hungry. I was in Wales. Uh, Wales is there's a, a county in England called Shropshire. That's where my ancestors come from. Uh, they came to America in 1645, Joseph Shropshire. And I wanted to see Shropshire, so I went there and then I discovered, that's where I met Abdurrahim Green, who's a famous daya in England. I've been in his house uh, several times and meeting with him, a great brother. But uh, then I met another brother. He said, you need to go to Wales. So I went to Wales. When we're walking down the street of Cardiff, uh, one of the major cities there, I saw a Christian church, same denomination that I attended before I became Muslim. And I walked over and I, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I knocked on the door and to my surprise, five ladies in hijab came to the door and they were meeting there with other members of this local church and they were packing food to distribute on the streets. Many people living on the streets are coming to Islam in England through the work of this group. Uh, we just need to be faithful to our calling, to what God has taught us to do. And it's our behavior, our example, that's going to bring people to Islam. Yeah, well said, uh, Uncle Sam. I think, you know, what, 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 you, what you've mentioned, what Brother Muhammad also alluded to, is that, you know, from the Islamic parlance, you've got, for example, certain words. You know, there's terminologies. You've got things like, you know, jihad, ijma, qiyas, and ibadah, ibadah. And when we, for example, look at a term like ibadah, which is understood as conventionally worship. And when you ask someone, what is ibadah? He'll tell you, well, it's your five daily salah. But the ibadah is also, the worship is also, what happens to you as a Muslim when you leave your house, going to the masajid, and you find yourself in an environment where there's, there's poverty, there's degradation, there's deprivation, there's environmental pollution, and you just simply go to the masajid, you make your salah, you go back home, or you go back to your work, and you do nothing about anything that's around you. And 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 the point being made, and I think you've articulated it uh, phenomenally, is that you know part of the spiritual quest in Islam is to concern yourself with regards to the environment. Part of the spiritual quest is to confront the injustices that you see that's happening in society and 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 thereby exemplifying the true ethical paradigm of the prophet muhammad sallallahu mm -hmm. in terms of how he was as described as being the walking turan that is in mm -hmm. fact what the sunnah really is and it seems to me that a lot of us for example uh, uncle sam um, um we, we we focus on the on on and maybe you may want to comment and brother muhammad could comment we focus on the the inherent literalism you know going for the letter of the law and you forgetting the spirit and uh, as many of the jews did in the time of jesus the pharisees and the sadducees did that you know he condemned their formalism they were very formalistic very religiously uh, there was an excessive amount of religiosity amongst the pharisees but that, that religiosity never found its exemplification in terms of what they did uh, in terms of, you know, living a balanced, 
uh, harmonious, good, kind, decent human beings. It, it never practically fell down. And I think as Muslims, we need to sometimes do that because we ourselves, and I speak for myself, are guilty of this kind of um, uh, challenges. How do we become better people? How do we how do we become better people to each other? You know, um, in terms of how we communicate, in terms of how we behave, in how we become ethical uh, exemplifications of the Quran. Uh, just simply then, as opposed to just literally um, looking at the outer parameters without understanding the very essence of what it means to be a Muslim in the 21st century. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Yusuf. And there are a lot of things that need to change. If we want to see the change, we look for change in the world. But we need to be the change that we want to see. We need to exemplify it. I'm very grateful to Safi Kaskas, whom you're going to be interviewing in this series. Safi was the change I needed to see in my own life. He brought me here. He uh, took care of me. And when I, after being here for a couple of weeks, I needed food, he said, uh, you need, there's a supermarket. I asked him, I said, Is, can your driver take me to the supermarket? He said, uh, well, he took me to the window and he pointed down the street. He says, you can buy food there. But I said, how am I going to get there? I said, somebody's going to kidnap me or they're going to do worse. And he laughed and he said, no. I said, you're going to be awfully hungry here if you don't help yourself. So walk down the street. Every time somebody passed me, I'd turn around and look over my shoulder to make sure he wasn't pulling out a knife to cut my throat. <laughs> um, you know, people started coming up to me on the street and they said, where are you from? Because I'm wider than most Saudis. And I would say nervously, I'm from United States. And they would reach out and hug me. And they would uh, invite me into their homes for dinner. Complete stranger, I'm just because I was an American. After being here for six months, I walked down the street. I heard Azan, Maghreb prayer time, and I walked down the street to the mosque. I knew I couldn't go to Mecca or Medina as a Christian because they need all the space for Muslims. And... Um, I didn't want to cause a problem. I didn't know if I could go in a mosque or if maybe a mosque wouldn't, certain mosque wouldn't accept me as a Christian pastor. Finally, I got up the courage and I just walked down the street, knocked on the door. I didn't know I could open the door and walk in. And Shafiq Zubir, the Muadhan, came to the door. He's a Burmese uh, Rohingya Muslim. And is the Muwethan at the mosque, call her to prayer. He says, may I help you? And I said, yes, uh, I'm a Christian from the United States. Is it okay if I come inside the mosque? And Shafiq reached out and hugged me. And he said, Allah Masalan, welcome. I went inside for three days. I sat in the back of the prayer hall and I just watched. I didn't understand the Arabic. I didn't understand the motions of standing, bowing, kneeling, putting face to the floor, sajud. I didn't understand. After three days, I said to Shafi, can you teach me to pray like a Muslim? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he taught me to pray Al-Fatiha. That's the first eight verses of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Bil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, My life changed, Ar-Rahman, Erohim. As I said earlier, God, the most merciful, the one who freely distributes forgiveness. Wow. I was just memorizing sounds and I would compare these sounds with Safi Kaskas translation of the Quran. That's where I began to understand Ar-Rahman, Erohim. And I found more grace and more mercy within the Muslims than I ever realized amongst Christians. I'm so grateful for the things that I've learned here in this country. And I'm at the heart of Islam. Nobody's covering up anything for me. 
What I feel bad about is that many Muslim youth, especially young adults, seem to be departing from the faith and are being called away. You know, I ask Muslim youth everywhere I go, I speak to youth groups, I said, who is your chief enemy? And they all know the answer to that, it's shaitan, it's Satan. He swore to Allah that he would take all of us, all the believers into hell with him. But we have God to protect us. And if we trust in him with all of our hearts, he will protect us from the wiles of Satan. And he will help us to stay on the straight path. Shaitan, when we fall down on the straight path or we fall off the path, Shaitan wants us to believe, well, God can never forgive you for that. All I can say is that the Quran says, never despair of the mercies of Allah. Of Allah. It reminds me of a song I used to sing when I was a kid teenager, as a Christian, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're great every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh Lord, great is thy faithfulness. This is Islam. I've learned so much about the grace and mercy of Allah. And much of it has been exemplified to me by other Muslims who've come in contact with me and who've treated me with great love and respect. I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for having been in South Africa on three different occasions with you. Uh, but we have so much work to do. Sure. I want to I want to add one more point before we're going to wrap up soon. Um, women, women, it's such a topical issue, and of course, the rights of women and um, women are, you know, given a bad light in the press in terms of Muslim women, particularly as being oppressed and so on. How how women uh, can be Muslim women can be part of your initiative and your efforts and your organization in terms of engaging this the question. Thank you for asking. Uh, we need sisters involved with Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. They can go to our website, mvpr.org, org. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit agency. Uh, we're very active now in the U.S. and Canada and now spreading in Australia and Pakistan and other countries. We, we need the help of sisters. My wife called me from Slovakia once and she says, all I see are men in your pictures. You know, that's because many women in Saudi Arabia feel that they can't have their picture made or something like this. We need women to be active. We need them on the streets with us, protesting nuclear weapons. We need them leading uh, the charge in, in many areas. So please contact us and tell us, I want to volunteer. We'll begin to get you involved. And pray for us. Pray for Asa. I call him Jesus. Let's hmm. Pray for Jesus. We'll certainly uh, do that. And Taj, his brother. Pray for Kuteba. Pray for others who are involved with us that will all stand in great love and honor, representing Allah, but also representing Prophet Muhammad and, and Jesus, the Messiah, and many other prophets. Oh, this is exciting. When we were able to reach congressmen and senators and governors and, and staff at the United Nations, when they began to understand who was Prophet Muhammad? People's lives are being changed. They think, you know, they used to think, well, he was just a warrior. He was a hater. He carried a sword. He tried to force people to be Muslim by the sword. No. Remember when the prophet approached, he was running from the his enemies in Mecca. He was running toward 
Tataya. He was climbing the mountain Tataya. He got to the top and some religious, so-called religious people, or they weren't even religious at all. They were worshiping idols. They came out by the numbers and they started, they had their children. There were stacks of rocks piled up everywhere and they had the children throwing rocks at the prophet and cursing him and swearing at him. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He never, he never picked up a rock and threw it back. And when he was cursed, he never cursed anyone in return. When his neighbor was dumping garbage across the fence into his yard, he didn't pick it up and throw it back across the fence. He was demonstrating the love of Allah for humankind. And I'm, I, I, I love the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He's knowing about him and studying his life has changed my life. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Brother Muhammad, um, I believe we, we still have Brother Muhammad there. Um, it, it, we, we're going to wrap up any parting comments and remarks that you'd like to make, Brother Muhammad, uh, to Uncle Sam. Uh, and then I'll give Sam the final words. I've uh, heard about Brother Sam and obviously to interact with him on a personal level, I'm impressed with the background and what he has to offer to us as Muslims. We can assist each other in different parts of the world. We need to work together. Um, I've, I've heard and there's some lessons to be taken from him. I think it's important also to bring in the facet of women and how to empower women. Remember, Islam actually took the status of women and equated that to men. And in Christendom, you had what was called the Levite marriages because the women were the property of the husbands. And when they had passed on, you know, you found that the second brother had to marry. They were forced to be into forced marriages. But Islam came and Islam actually separated itself from those types of ideologies. Islam came and a woman, her rights need to be protected. And she has willies and a willie makes sure that her rights are protected. So Alhamdulillah, you know, uh, I'm, I, I think, you know, this opportunity that we have this tonight is lessons for everybody. I believe over the next few days, there will be more, more programs of this particular nature. And we'd like to be part and parcel of this, even just as an audience and begin to appreciate some, some of the sensitivities from the other dais in other parts of the world. And Alhamdulillah, we have a broad spectrum of speakers. So I'm going to be quite glued to your show for the next few days, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for that, Muhammad. Um, Jazakallah for that. And Uncle Sam, uh, give us one message. We as South Africans, we, we our, our position has been, you know, in, in, in dire straits over the past two years, besides the lockdown and the COVID, we've had, you know, a lot of tragedies that you've probably seen in the news in KZN. Give us a message, your message to the South Africans on the airwaves of uh, these platforms. What's your parting message to us? I know that South Africa has suffered a lot because of this pandemic. Um, I've been studying a lot about signs of, you know, Jesus sat down with his disciples, his Sahaba, and he surprised them. He said, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going away, but I will return. And the Sahaba said, well, what will be the signs of your return? He said, there will be wars and rumors of war. There will be pestilence and disease like the world has never seen. And I he said, the love of many will wax cold. They will start leaving the faith. You know, 60% of Christian youth today say they want nothing to do with organized religion. It's the same percentages with Jewish youth. And I'm afraid it's going to be the same percentages of Muslim youth. Um, it said the situation will become so bad. It's in the, it's, and this is confirmed in the Hadith and the Sunnah as well. The children will be rebellious against their parents and they'll rise up and, and testify against their parents publicly and condemn them. Oh, God help us. Just protect our families in the midst of all of this. 
The number one religion today is not Judaism, it's not Christianity, it's not Islam, it's not Hinduism or Buddhism. The number one religion in the world today is materialism. And people are worshiping in shopping malls, not in mosques or churches or synagogues or temples. They go to the shopping mall on a regular basis and they say, oh, if I could just have this, I would be happy. <laughs> the Quran is very, in many places, reminds us that all of this is temporal. It's an illusion. And what is to come is eternal. Asa put it this way. Jesus told his disciples, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust, moth dis, rust destroy and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. These are the commandments of, uh, of Islam as well. Do good works. Show that you're a Muslim through your good works. The good works are not going to bring you salvation, but you'll be rewarded for them later. Our salvation comes by faith in Allah and by obedience to him. And good works, that's part of our obedience. That's what we're doing as we're walking down the street path. We're looking for people who are hungry. We want to feed them. We're looking for people who have no place to sleep, no housing. We try to organize our states and our societies in a way that we can provide them housing when they can't provide it for themselves. We look for people who are unemployed and we try to employ them. And we look for people who are suffering because of, of uh, weapons of mass destruction or because of hatred and Islamophobia. And we try to protect them. May God help us and keep us faithful. May he protect us as we walk down the straight path. May we be faithful to him. May our families be protected as we seek to serve him and serve our neighbors. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Jazakallah khair, Uncle Sam. It's been very moving and it's been an absolute privilege and a joy listening to you. Um, it's, it's, you, always, you always have this ability of touching my heart and I believe you've touched the hearts of uh, a lot of us out there, including that of the viewers. Uh, we hope to have more engagements and sessions with you as we learn through your experiences and certainly in you being able to share some of your knowledge with us. And uh, we want to thank also our uh, other guest, Brother Muhammad Kuvadi, who has joined us and assisted us in, in interacting with uh, Uncle Sam Shropshire. Sam has been uh, very dear to me. He's uh, met me for the first time. We met each other in 2017. Um, and I've maintained a cordial, fantastic relationship with this humble human being and humble soul. And so that's the end of the show today. Uh, we will be tackling more of such issues. We do have a fantastic lineup um, with a whole range of scholars over the next few days. Uh, and until then, this is Yusuf Ismail. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Thank you.